everyone. Um, my name is Christine Flood. I work for Red Hat. I'm here to talk to you about Checkpoint Restore, which is uh, one way to do a fast startup of your Java applications. Um, I need to start this talk with two caveats, the first of which is that traveling yesterday was yucky, and so I'm very tired, and therefore I am over-caffeinated. Um, I am probably going to talk very fast. If you need me to slow down or if anything is not clear, please stop me. And this is a small group, so I'm very happy to entertain questions while I go. And the second caveat is that a lot of these talks have been hardcore engineering work that they've already done. And this is more of a, this is what I'm working on, this is where I'm going, let's make sure that we're heading in the right direction that's going to be useful for you guys. So I appreciate any feedback. Um, my, I will have my email address up at the end. I love to talk to real users. I want to be sure that the stuff we're working on is the right stuff for you. All right. So when I gave this talk at FOSDEM, um, I had less slides. I have more slides now, so this is the more detail. But they thought I was kidding. So let me be absolutely clear here. I am not kidding. <laughs> this is, the tools are out there, and this, this is real. Okay, so um, checkpointing your Java program. So let's say that... For example, you work in a container world, and you want to deploy your software, and you want it to come up very fast. You want the same Java program to be fully optimized. You want the JIT to be fully warmed up, all of your classes loaded, all of that startup work done, and you've got your heap fully compacted, and everything is ready to go. Well, what Checkpoint gives you is the ability to write that image out to the file system. Now let me stop right now and say this is not object serialization. There is no uh, marshalling or anything of objects. This is just a straight bit blit of the memory out to, out to disk, and it's very fast. And the restore has the ability to restore in multiple JVMs. So like I said, it, it's a way to deploy your software in a container. You can build it up to right to the point where you want to run over and over again, and you can deploy it on multiple JVMs. So if you have like seven instances of it running, you can bring up the same image seven times. Um, another use case, this was the obvious one to me. Um, if you have a long running number crunching ap application, you can just write it out to file system every iteration. And then if something bad happens, like you get a crash, you can restore the last one and keep going. Uh, this is sort of a classic use for checkpointing. This isn't what the the supercomputed guys do, but I imagine that there are Java programmers out there that are running like weather simulations and stuff like that that would find it useful. Um, I gave this talk at FOSDEM and I got two more ya Java use cases. So if you have a buggy program that tends to fail after like 24 hours or something, I, I, ha I, have, I have been in this situation in my life, right? Maybe you want to checkpoint very, you know, fairly often and then you will have the checkpoint right before it failed that you can go back and work on over and over again and make a much, you know, might make your life better. Um, there were people at, at FOSDOOM who wanted to do heap dumps, but the time it took them to do a heap dump perturbed the program enough that they didn't get the bad behavior they were trying to fix. So you can checkpoint it in a fairly recent, play, fairly frequently, and then come back and do a heap dump from the point that you checkpointed. Okay, let me be absolutely clear here. Everybody has talked about all the hard work they've put into startups and all the hard work they've put into other things. I'm not proposing anything heroic here. Um, there's already a tool called Checkpoint Restore in User Space that does this for Linux processes. So all I'm proposing is that we build on top of that. Uh, so what is Creo? It's Checkpoint Restore in User Space. It's a Linux utility. It copies the entire process date into files. Um, you can read more about it here. Adrian, he's my hero. He's now my best buddy. Um, he did this as his PhD thesis, and I've been working with him for, you know, talking to him and getting information from him and back and forth trying to figure out how to make this work for Java. So they use Creo for process migration. So there we know that it's going to be able to bring up your, your JVM on another host if you want. Uh, quick process spin up, container migration. So... Let's take a step back. What's my inspiration? What's my motivation? Why am I here? Um, I've been around for a while. I started my career on list machines, and I love them. If you could give me my list machine back in the modern world, I would be a happy camper. Um, and they had something called a save world command. 
So you would load all your stuff into your Lisp listener, and then you could save it, and then you could do some more stuff. And if you didn't like that, you could go back to your last one. Or if you did like it, you could do an incremental save the world on top of it. I want this for Java. And you know, maybe you use it in a read eval print loop. Maybe you use it with a dynamic language. Or maybe, I don't know, I just I want that capability. And I realized that you know, Creo is out there, but there are some Java-specific things that we can do from, you know, from Java to make it more useful for us. Um, for example, if you're writing everything out to memory, maybe you want to do a compaction of the heap, and you, know, you can give the memory back to the OS. And so you've only got, rather than the 64 gigabyte sparse heap full of garbage, you've now got two gigabytes of densely used memory. And maybe you want to write that out when you checkpoint it. And then when you restore it, you can allocate the more space that you need, but you're not ending up paying the price of writing that out to disk or sending it over the network to the place where you want to bring it back up. Maybe, now, I have to do another caveat here. Um, I spent a lot of my life thinking about GC. So whenever I see something cool, I think, well, is there something in GC? Right, so one cool idea I had was that if you have a Java process and it's running and it's doing its build up, maybe when on the restore side you want to do something quick and dirty and fast, maybe you want to swap GC algorithms, right? So if we have our Java process during the startup that's running parallel GC and doing all the heavy lifting to get everything initialized, maybe when you bring it back up to run the actual application, you're willing to run with Epsilon GC. You're willing to you know, play roulette. And maybe you won't run out of memory. And if you do run out of memory, you'll have to do a full GC. But what this buys you is that you freed up all that space for the GC data structures. And not only that, I can go in and I can knock out all of the barriers that you need for your card table. right? So your code can run faster, and you can have more space in the restored image. Everybody is sitting there nodding their heads. There's nobody that's going to push back on this and say, what? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry? OK, I never said Shenandoah. <laughs> um, I said card table barriers. And my. OK, so we're talking about things I want to do, right? I'm thinking that the compiler will give me hints to say that this is actually a barrier code, and I can knock this out. I don't want to recompile all the methods. I think that would kind of defeat the purpose of what I'm trying to do. Um, but knocking out the barriers could make life better. Yes? Yes, but, but you know at compile time that what you're doing is inserting a barrier. So you know at machine code generation, well, you know more about this than I do. So you can tell me I'm lying, but I have talked to people that know more about it than I do who have said that I'm not. afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's keep going. I really don't have enough for 45 minutes, so I'm not worried about time. All right, another thought I had was that there was a fascinating paper at PLEI a few years ago uh, by the Remix folks who used the hardware performance counters to notice that they were thrashing caches on their data. And they were able to show for some benchmarks that they, were, they paid the cost of GCing to reshape the data so that they didn't have that cache thrashing. And you guys probably all know about cache thrashing, but just in case you don't, you have one thread banging on value A and one thread banging on value B. And because they're ping-ponging the cache line, um, they get some horrid performance. So if during the startup phase we happen to notice that we have cache thrashing, um, we could maybe pad the data structures before we write them out. Uh, I'm getting more and more into fantasy land, but this is something I can imagine doing because the part of the code that you're running on warm-up before you checkpoint is not the code that you're worried about the performance of. So if you have ideas of things that you would love to do, but you can't fit them into a JIT because the JIT is time constrained, I think you could do them in the checkpointing part, perhaps. All right, so one of the things that we're going to need that became clear 
is we're going to need to provide hooks, both on checkpointing and restoring. Um, I got taken out to the tool shed uh, at Fosdom by folks who said that, well, if you cash a certificate, it's going to expire, and you're going to restore the JVM, and it's not going to be there, and life is going to be horrible. So there are going to, uh, like in the list VM, like in the list machine, sorry, there are going to have to be hooks, and there are going to have to be, uh, you guys are going to have to be smart about your programming. So if there are things that you need to null out, like certificates, you're gonna, um, we're going to have to provide you with a handle so that you can clear those things before you save it out. And similarly, on the other end, they're going to have to be hooks to reestablish things like certificates or secure connections or whatever. Um, again, this is, this is stuff that I haven't implemented yet that I'm just thinking about. So if you guys can see holes or problems, let me know. Um, things like number of processors is an obvious one. Even I thought of that one, right? So if you start out running on an eight processor machine and you come back on a two processor machine, you might have to adjust your work stealing queues. There are, there are things that you might need to do. Again, you know, there, there are things that the JVM caches like number of processors, um, size of the heap. I don't know if it caches the machine name, but it probably does. Things like that that you might need to restore on restore time. All right, and maybe, just maybe the Java programmer wants some control over where checkpointing occurs. You might want to do it at a point in your program where you know that there's not a lot of garbage, right? You have all this interim garbage, and you get to the bottom of the loop, and that all, that all can go away. So maybe that's where you want to checkpoint it. So what I'm trying to motivate here is that there are things that we want to do from Java that aren't in the basic crew, and I think that it's worth having a Java API to give us more control. You guys all agree? Do you want to be able to get to this from Java? <laughs> all right, so this is just all, uh, this is my proposed straw man. I know there are things that are bad here, and we're going to have to work on it to get it right. But you have a world class. Um, you can run check, and that makes sure that you're running on an appropriate machine with an appropriate Linux kernel to actually use the utility. Um, it makes sure that you don't have any data structures that, I, that, 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 that are problematic. That's my out, right? If there are things that I, don't, that I know don't work on Korea, we'll, we'll look for them and reject it. Um, you can save the world to dump the world exactly as it is. You can save incremental. That's really nice. So if I save the world a minute ago and I save it again and memory pages haven't changed, um, I don't have to write it all out again. I can only write the diff. Um, Save with Epsilon GC, eh, probably a good idea, but we'll see. Um, optimize to do the two back-to-back -back full GCs you need to get rid of all of the weak references and stuff to get the leap heap down as small as possible. Uh, maybe optimize the memory layout. We've got restore, which will restore the world. We've got migrate to maybe move the machine, move the JVM, you know, have control from Java and say, hey, let's, let's put myself over there. Um, you know, add a checkpoint hook, add a restore hook. That's sort of my idea of what's going to go on. So the current status. I've talked a lot. I, I spent a lot of time in the lab, so I've talked about what I want to have happen. But what we really have happening is we have a JNI tool right now that can checkpoint the world. Um, it can check to make sure that it runs and it can save the world. And now from a command line, we can restore the world. So I have a proof of concept baby prototype. That'll, that'll come. So, so far, I have tried the application, tried it out on one thing, which is a random number generator. I have an interest in random numbers, so I have worked on them before. But um, I can show that the Java process isn't running. I can run it. This is from the command line, but I've also done it from inside of Java. Uh, the process is no longer running, and then I can restore it. So for this is a simple number crunching application. This is not a web server. You know, uh, people. I am. I am working on getting web servers. I'm working on getting middleware. I work for Red Hat. There are a bunch of things that we want to have proof of concepts on that I'm not there yet. But I wanted to come and talk to people now, right? Talk to people at the beginning, get input, and then and then we'll work through it. Um, I can restore multiple instances. I've restored it several times, and it works. Um, I have a prototype of calling from Java. I have, I've called it twice. Um, what did I want to say about this? Okay, so this had one gotcha that 
probably is obvious to all of you that surprised me, but it just is a way of thinking about this in a different in a different manner, and that is that I saved the current time, right? This is a common idiom, right? You save the start time, you save the end time, and you figure out how long it took. But here, I uh, checkpoint the world here, and when I come back and ran it the next day, the elapsed time for my benchmark was like 25 hours, right? Because I had saved it one day and restored it the next. So if you're going to use this utility, you have to be careful about what you cache. Well, at least in this particular instance. Um, but this is sort of what I envision for actually running it, in that you know, you're running a loop that does a lot of setup. In, in the number case, uh, I took you know, a ton of, of random numbers. I, I, I took the remainder and put them in bins. And if you have a good random number, that means that your bins are an even size. And so the running of all of that random number generation and binning takes a long time. But the, t the, the test to print out the statistics that you may be interested was fast. And so that's sort of, if you have a loop that generates a lot of stuff and then you want to save it after all that stuff is generated and then restore it just to do what you want to check or to print out whatever the details you have, whatever questions you have about the data. That's the use case I have in mind. All right, so the part that's really interesting is how this works under the covers. Not the stuff that I want to do, but the stuff that's going on in Creo. So I don't know that this is actually accurate now. At one point in time, this is what a Java process looked like. Right? You have a startup thread. It generates a bunch of GC threads, compiler threads, Java threads. Um, that gets kind of complicated. Um, but it's all mirrored in your slash proc hierarchy. So you have a different slash proc file directory for each of the PIDs that run resist under the top PID. So from now on, I'm just going to talk about a single Java process, but you can know in your mind that I'm really talking about the whole hierarchy of processes under the initial Java one. So you have a, a CREO process that's running that you either connect to or you start up, and it will send a ptrace Cs to your Java thread. So like all good open source projects, I'm basing my, what I want to do on Creo, and Creo is based on, on ptrace. <laughs> but what seizing does is that it just stops the Java process, and that will recursively go down and stop all of the threads that are working in the Java process. It injects some parasite code into your Java process. So the Java code that was there is stored away, and this parasite code now can operate on the world as though it, with all the permissions of the Java process. So it will copy the virtual memory. It will look in SMAPs and see, oh, these are the virtual memory areas that you're using. And it will copy them out to the file system. I didn't realize until I was listening to the talk on CGC today, I'm really curious to see as to when CGC does you know, the triple memory thing, whether it actually specifies this in the SMAPs file. So that's my, my, my takeaway question is to find out. Uh, maybe one of the hooks is to, to turn that off before you write it out. Um, you also have memory map files, and the idea is to copy those out to the file system as well. You've got file descriptors, whatever file dis files you have open, uh, they get copied out, whatever the core parameters, so I'm calling Java, right? Th these things are all, pos are all visible in the stat file. I called it with the following parameters, blah, 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 blah. All of that stuff gets written out. And then they use ptrace peak user to get the value for the registers in the stack. So it can get the entire process data. I thought that was pretty cool. So basically, as it was explained to me, anything that the Linux kernel knows, the, the CREO can get access to and write out. So it's interesting because the parasite code, like I said, has the, right, has the same credentials and can read the contents of memory. Um, the cleanup, it uses ptrace again. It, it restores the original code over the parasite code and leaves the Java process running. On a previous slide, I'm sorry, I'm going very fast and I'm skipping things. I mentioned it was like a fork, right? So at the end of this, you can either continue the Java process running or you can stop it. And if you clean up the parasite code and keep running, it's like the, the, the checkpoint was never there. And then you detach, and life is good, and back to where you were. Um, 
Restore is also cool. I'm a little bit less clear on how this works, so bear with me. Um, but you start up a Creo process and that gets restored into the Java process. So the Creo process figures out what your shared resources are. You know, right? If you were looking at, you know, some, if you had some memory map file on the, on the first one, it's going to go and see that you have the memory map file on the second one and see who you're sharing that with. Um, it's going to recreate the processes with the same PIDs. And I'm going to talk about why that's OK in a minute. Um, so your task tree is going to look exactly the same as it looked on the original machine. And you're going to do the memory mappings, the timers, the credentials, the threads. They all get written by a restore flub, restore or blob um, into the Java process. And then the, the Creo process and becomes the Java process and keeps going. So the obvious gotchas, um, number of processors, size of heap, certificates, these are all going to need to be dealt with. I think that we're going to have sort of a, a, a global hook that everybody's going to want, and then user-defined hooks to put in. Um, open files must be present on the restore host, right? If on one host you were looking, say, you were saving perf data, and you had slash temp whatever the perf data file was, that file is going to have to be there on the restore file because it's expecting it. Now, whether you want your perf data to follow you to restore, I don't know. We have to think about that, what that means. Um, you have to have the same PIDs on Checkpoint and Restore. I have, it's been assured to me that if you're running a PID manager that that all just works. Um, I haven't experienced it yet. I haven't gone and tried it. So I'm CHF at Red Hat. If you don't buy what I'm selling, I want to hear it. If you want what I'm selling, let me know. If you want to help me make it work, we're Red Hat. We're, it's, it's all done in the open. We welcome contributions. We welcome help. Any questions or tomatoes or whatever? <laughs> Thanks. So this was uh, uh, a lot of extra time. So I think this is so much interesting and also new technology that has been fully proven yet that it might facilitate uh, uh, both like questions and a really good discussion. I hope so. so. Uh, take it away. Let's try to use this time to uh, discover the possibilities and potential flaws of cryo. Yes.